so using uh, the sacculus and utriculus to detect linear acceleration is very similar to using the canals to detect angular acceleration with a couple of differences. First difference is that the hair cells are embedded, instead of into a cupula, they're embedded into a, essentially a rock. And this makes sense. If you want to measure gravity, I mean, I could do this, I could have this. You, you don't really want to use a feather to measure gravity. You want to use a stone, something weighty. You want something that, that gravity can act on. Force equals mass times acceleration. You need a mass there. And so there is a, a, a um, otoconial mass, which is made out of otoconin, which is a protein, uh, with calcium carbonate all over. There's a calcium carbonate in here, and this is all held together with a, a goo, a gel. There are a lot of proteins in here, um, and the, almost all of them, almost all of them, are made only during fetal life. So the otoconeal mass that you come out uh, uh, with at birth is the one that you have when you're 70, 80, 90 years old or older. All right, so this, is, this actually weighs something. It's something uh, substantial that gravity can, can operate on. And the hair cells are attached to this otoconeal mass by this gel. Their hair, the bundles are in this gel, which is attached to the otoconeal mass. Okay, that's one big difference. The second big difference is that the hair cells are not oriented all in the same direction. They are oriented either towards or away from the striola. This is the striola. It's just a stripe down the middle of the, of the organ, either this, um, and the organ of the, uh, of the sacculus and utriculus is called the macula. So it's either um, oriented towards or away. And uh, in, in this, this now shows you the resting state for the sacculus and for the utriculus. So what the sacculus is, is, is um, it's oriented in the vertical direction. And so at rest, when all that's happening is that you're, you're upright and gravity is acting upon your head, it's acting upon this otoconeal mass and there is resting discharge because the otoconeal mass is displaced downwards. The utriculus it's sitting on top of the hair cells. So it's in the horizontal plane. Um, and the hair cells are oriented towards the estriola. It doesn't actually matter. I would not worry about remembering whether it's oriented to towards or away from the estriola. The important point is that the sacculus is able to signal uh, up and down motion. So let's say that you jump up and down. As you're going up, Gravity is acting more upon you. This, this rock will be displaced down. There will be, um, it'll be a greater stimulus on these hair cells um, and a lesser stimulus on these hair cells. Um, and then when you come back down, this floats up and you have this moment of, uh, of, of um, weightlessness. Okay, you have the moment outside of gravity, and the, that feeling comes from this floating up. It's that one moment where it's not doing what it's doing virtually all of your life, which is floating down. Okay, so that's the sacculus. The utriculus is going to give you linear acceleration, translational acceleration in, in, in all of the directions. And just to make you understand how that works, we'll go to the board for a moment. The utriculus looks something like that, and the striola comes down around the center. And if you took all of these hair cells, what you would see is that they describe, if you took this and you put it here, and you took this and you put it here, and you took this one and you put it here, what you'd find out is that because of this curve, you actually code for um, translation in, in both the X and Y direction. So in, you code for all the translational in the horizontal plane. Okay, so, um, so that is the, uh, that's basically how these things work. Um, what's the most common problem uh, that, what's the most common vestibular problem? Uh, it is a 
uh, syndrome called benign proximal positional vertigo, often affectionately named BPPV. So benign proximal positional vertigo. And this happens because, remember that this otoconial mass is, is put together, held together by some, some goo and, and it's made during embryogenesis and then you're stuck with it. And just from wear and tear or from trauma, whichever, uh, and actually two people in my lab have, had, have gotten this, young people have gotten this from riding ro roller coasters. A little piece of the otoconial mass can be dislodged. So it's a tiny little piece. But now it's in the vestibulum and it floats around and it's going to go, it's going to make its way to the m most, the lowest point in the vestibulum. And the lowest point in the vestibulum happens to be the posterior canal. So if we look at a side view of a person, here's the horizontal canal, here's the anterior canal and here's the posterior canal. And the posterior canal has its crista down here. So with time, that little piece of rock is gonna make its way down here. And now, but it's only on one side. So what you're gonna get is a, is a stimulation of the posterior canal on one side without any inhibition in the contralateral anterior canal. That's seriously weird. So it's going to give a person the sense of vertigo. Um, the, and as you move around, as you, as you lie down, it's going to move back, back here. And then when you get up, all of a sudden it comes back here and it tickles that, that ampulla again. And now you've got the sense of vertigo again. So it's going to come in a paroxysmal way with changing position. So, luckily, there's something to be done about it. And that is basically to try and throw this rock back into the utriculus. And the way you do that is you figure out which ear it is, which is not that simple. And that's one of the great things that an ENT can do is it can tell you which ear uh, you've got this in. And then you essentially do a lot of very rapid sit-ups that allow you to throw the rock back out of the canal and into the utriculus. All right, so I, I had a very fit um, uh, graduate student in my lab who, who got this from riding a roller coaster, and he was very fit, and yet he did this so often that he had, he had incredibly sore muscles, incredibly sore abdominal muscles. So it takes a lot of this, but it's doable, and um, eventually it appears that these little bits get reabsorbed and, and uh, the problem can go away. All right, we are going to look at ambiguities in the vestibular message.